Welcome <laughs> to Future Ready Leadership, our virtual meetup. Um, we are a part of Women in Technology of the Heartland. Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, if it's your first time or if you're a returning member, we're so excited to have you and to build this wonderful, talented community of uh, women in tech. So thank you uh, to Monica, Katie, CJ, and Stephanie for being our lovely panelists. Um, we have Monica, Director of IT Leadership um, and Membership Development at AIM. Uh, we have Katie Barton, Chief Information Officer at Gallup. We have CJ Jackson, Manager of Q&A Release Services, or QA, sorry, Quality Assurance uh, and Release Services. She's also a CMC coach. Uh, she's with OPPD. And then we have Stephanie Bazada, uh, Principal Cloud and Data Insights Platforms with Union Pacific. So excited to hear these lovely women speak uh, and tell us all about it. Uh, just a little bit about Women in Tech of the Heartland. It's a monthly meetup uh, to support uh, sharing knowledge and networking, uh, specifically as it relates to the tech community. Uh, so anything you guys want to share, if you're looking for jobs, if you uh, want to share your jobs or just events in general, any sort of community building, we're interested in, in sharing that and uh, uh, just kind of getting closer with and building connections with each other. Um, it's open to everyone interested in advancing women in the tech field and uh, always looking for speakers, uh, especially for technical topics. So we're excited to, to share some of that with you today. We have several announcements today. I'm going to go through them kind of fast just because we have so many, which is great, though, uh, just showing us how strong this community is and how we can support it. So we have an e-commerce meetup Wednesday, July 29th. That will take place at Elevator uh, and features Chris Beecham as their speaker. Uh, and I can share this with anyone who wants this afterward. Uh, and we'll also provide it in the notes in our newsletter. So if you're not signed up for that, sign up. Uh, we also have Nebraska Co. July 13th through the 15th. Uh, that will be in Lincoln, uh, but there's more uh, details on that link as well. Tech Talkers is a bi-weekly event. Um, it's a virtual event as well with Jessica Coder as the host. So check that out. We have Connectaha that is going to be July 25th. Uh, that will take place at UNO Scott Conference Center. We have Bar Camp Omaha, that's August 20th. So you can find more out about that as well on their website. There's the Omaha Game Developers Association meetup, second Thursday of every month. That is uh, at Do Space, and you can find more uh, out about it uh, at their website. Then we have uh, a couple of AIM specific events that we wanted to talk about. Uh, we have uh, the AIM Tech Mixer, that's June 29th. That is a free monthly event that offers like the more casual environment to connect uh, anyone who's interested in tech or looking for a job potentially and kind of connect them to your companies and just get some more awareness uh, out about our, our different members uh, that we have at AIM. And so if you want to sign up for that, you can uh, connect with any one of us that works with AIM after this, or you can visit that link as well. All right. And then finally, we have our Business Skills Academy. That's going to be every Thursday in July. So four different days, uh, 7th, the 14th, 21st, and 28th. And it is a new academy, brand new. Um, and it kind of focuses on some new professionals to the corporate tech environment. So if you have new hires that you're kind of trying to onboard Maybe they need some help with the, they have the technical, but maybe they need some help on the interpersonal. You guys can enroll this, uh, enroll them in this academy. And so it just kind of helps them build those new skills in business and increase their understanding of interpersonal, technical, and HR challenges involved in business. Uh, feel free to email me or call me for more details or visit our website for that as well. Whew. So that was a lot of <laughs> a lot of events. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, and then just upcoming with Women in Tech of the Heartland, July, there's not going to be a meeting. Uh, so happy summer, enjoy that lovely month. Um, but we will be planning for future events. I think like Monica mentioned, we're planning on coming back in August. Yep. And finally, this is an exciting part. Uh, stick around for the drawing. This will be at the end of uh, the fireside chat for Future Ready Leadership. Uh, it's our AIM Heartland Developers Conference. It's three different tickets we're going to be raffling off, and they're going to be a $299 value. So that conference is great. Talk, if you haven't been there, I'm sure a lot of you have uh, joined before in previous years, but it is a conference that's just kind of dedicated to talking about different technical and just upcoming um, concepts in the tech industry, especially in the Heartland specifically. So it talks about different technical topics, um, and they also like touch on things like innovation as well. 
All right. And then it's kind of weird saying thank you to our sponsors when I work for them, but thank you to AIM uh, for all that AIM does. For those of you who don't know, AIM uh, is, institute, is a nonprofit and our mission is to build a strong and diverse tech community. And we do that through our outreach, our education, uh, educational programs, and also our career development. So um, that's a little bit about our mission, but you can find out a lot more about us on our website. There's uh, again saying thank you. Thank you guys for joining. We couldn't do this without you all coming and being present in these events and being engaged with your community. So that is so important uh, for you guys to show up to this and really spend your time doing this. So just huge thank you to everyone who showed up. Uh, and with that, I think we can uh, kick everything off. I'll go back to this. Yeah. Well, thank you, Addison. So hello, my name is Monica, uh, Monica Philp, Director of uh, Tech Leadership and Member Development at AIM Institute. I'm also one of the co-organizers of this amazing group of women in tech. And so if you are one of the co-organizers, give us a wave, a virtual wave, so people can know who you are. Say hello to our audience. There you go, yep. <laughs> so if you are looking to be a speaker, if you're looking to be a sponsor for, you know, we're always looking for those opportunities. If you're looking to sponsor this event or be a speaker, definitely reach out to one of us or message us on our one of our channels. Uh, we are, like, like we mentioned, we're always looking for great speakers and, and people to support us. And so uh, let's fire up the chat box and introduce yourself. Let us know where you're joining us from, maybe what company you're with and what do you do in your current role or if you are in transition, let us know what you're looking for. And so, um, as Addison mentioned, you know, our mission is to connect, empower, and support each other um, on our IT journeys, you know, and so we're there to support one another. And so, uh, we Let's go ahead and get started. We have an incredible group of amazing IT leaders joining me today who came, you know, from different organizations, have different IT journeys. And so I'd love to just kick things off with introductions. So each panel guest will have an opportunity to introduce themselves, briefly share your IT journey and your current role. And so let's go ahead and kick it off with Katie. Thank you, Monica. And first, before I get started, a huge thank you to you, Monica and Addison, for organizing this group. It is important for females and especially in technology to have this type of platform that we can collaborate and talk and share about just life, right? It's, um, first of all, it is still a very male dominated field and women face different challenges than men. And we also know through a lot of data and research we've done about women in the workplace, women just in general face different challenges than men do in the workplace. So this is incredibly important and um, to make these connections and to have um, a safe space where we can talk to each other, vent, ask questions. Um, so thank you. Um, introduce myself, my name is Katie Barton. I, my background is in technology. I started my career as a software developer and um, I've worked at Gallup my entire career. So I started here as a developer. Um, did, I, did I get my job at Gallup and say, I'm gonna go work for a company and stay there my whole life? No, I was a young 21 year old when I started, but I have loved the, um, I love the organization. I love the leadership. I love the opportunity. And so I really did grow, um, grow up at Gallup and grow my career at Gallup. So when I started, um, there were probably about 30, let's call it 30 to 40 in the software team um, that I was one of, but fast forward time, 23 years. And um, now we have 260 that are part of our technology organization. So I oversee all of our software development, network infrastructure and cybersecurity. So I get to um, spend my day with some really smart people strategizing about the platforms that we create, um, what we're doing to safeguard our data. Gallup has a lot of data and um, important information that of course, uh, the minds of every CIO and many of you on the call are probably cybersecurity. And so um, making sure we're doing um, that and then supporting our business for growth. Like all of you, our business is growing and, um, and we're, we have more clients and are hiring more than we ever have before. But at the heart of what Gallup does and what my team supports is really helping workplaces think about um, how they collect data and then use that data to make their organizations better through understanding people's strengths. So hopefully each of you know your strengths, Clifton Strengths Finder. And then um, of course your employees, I hope they're asking you about your experience at work and your culture and your well-being, and then doing things to make sure that you have a great place to work and that um, you are, your opinions are counting, you have what you need, you're learning and growing, and that um, you're living a real well 
life um, through your career. So that's what we do at Gallup. And that's what our systems do is all the technology behind it to support that. Awesome. Thank you. Let's go ahead and have maybe CJ go next. Sure. Thank you. I also would just like to uh, reiterate what Katie was saying. This is an awesome opportunity, Monica. So I thank you for inviting me. This is actually my first um, time attending one of these. So I'm, I'm pretty stoked about this. Uh, my name is CJ Jackson and I work at OPPD and I am a manager over quality assurance and release services here at OPPD. I got my start off in technology kind of by happenstance um, coming out of college um, several years ago. I won't give you guys the date, uh, but several years ago coming out of college and got a job with IBM and happened to be working on a, a system over there and uh, got introduced to project management. And so that's actually how I got my start. I was a project manager and a program manager for several years. And I did some consulting for a very long time. Um, about three and a half years ago, I came to OPPD as a consultant, um, as a project manager, <laughs> doing one of the largest lists they had done on their technology site with a legacy application. And once that was done, um, I was approached to see if I would like to join OPPD as an FTE, which of course, um, I was just like, absolutely yes. And so I've been in my role for going on two years now. And uh, what I really love about OPPD is kind of where we're going right now. Uh, we are embarking upon a journey that is just very exciting and very new, getting to our powering the future of 2050 which companies don't do strategic plans that far out in advance. It's normally like 10 years or something of that nature. But here we are in 2022 and we're talking about how do we get to 2050? Yes, 2050. So there is a large strategic plan in place that OPPD has um, to get us to reducing our carbon footprint, having reliable and secure energy, and also being a digital utility. And so that in and of itself requires a lot of transformation and I'm just super, super excited about it. So um, I am now living within digital transformation as part of my organization. I used to be part of a different um, uh, business unit within OPPD. Um, but what I will say is one of the things that I really am keen in on right now is getting my team to really have clarity and connection, courage and confidence. And I think that is so important as we're moving forward towards the future because we all need clarity to understand what that North Star looks like for us as an organization. And we have to understand what our role is day to day and how it plays into that larger strategic initiative or initiatives that are going on within the organization. And being able to connect to that and understanding that the work that we do here at OBPD really is life-saving. If you think about energy, you can't even service a hospital. A hospital can't service and provide medical care without energy. So we literally provide one of the most needed resources, you know, that a, a, a place can have, a country can have, a state can have, a city can have. So I think it's just really important work that we do here. And it's going to take a lot of courage for us to turn this ship around and move forward as we're making hard decisions and having hard conversations within our organization to make sure we're doing the right thing at the right time for the right reasons and doing it with confidence and making sure that everyone's empowered and everyone has the skills that they need in order to make an impact and making sure that people are also being developed in the, in the process of that. So uh, that's my story. And again, I just wanna thank you for having me. Oh, thank you for sharing. Uh, let's go ahead and, and Stephanie, do you wanna go next? Do a quick introduction. Yeah. Yep. So Stephanie Bazada, uh, Union Pacific Railroad, and I also want to say thank you. And also, I, I can't believe I've never plugged into one of these before. I'm excited to know this group is here, and I can't wait to join you guys for, for future um, events. So I'm sorry. Hopefully those dogs won't be too distracting. It never fails, right? You start talking off mute and they go. Uh, so I've, I've also, similar to Katie Bennett, Union Pacific, my entire career, um, my background is electronics engineering. Um, I started out as a telecom network engineer many years ago. Um, and kind of worked my way through the company in different roles. I spent time in information assurance. Uh, and then a, a lot of uh, my more recent years, I've been in our net control, uh, which is really our core logistics platform. So you think about a railroad, 106 year old company, mainframe system. We've been on a journey to replatform that into an API modern ecosystem over the last 10 years. And that's going to go live this year. So I spent 
um, a significant portion of my time um, leading teams, offshore development teams, decomposing features, and, and, and designing and delivering those systems. Um, and then in the last few years, I've had the opportunity to, to really focus on our enterprise platforms. And so, again, those API ecosystems, those core platforms um, that all of these systems run on. Um, and most recently, uh, around 18 months ago, uh, we had a new CIO join our company. Rahul Jalali came um, to Union Pacific from Walmart. Um, at that time, you know, he really challenged us. So it's similar to the themes I heard you talk about, TJ and Katie, is we have to be looking in the whole reason we're here, right? Keeps are ready. Uh, so where are we going? What's our strategy? How do we take this tech IT mindset and really modernize ourselves into a true tech forward company um, as a railroad, as a logistics provider? Um, our strategy over the last ever since I can remember, was optimized, right? We're, we're the backbone of the economy. We need to deliver real faster. Um, where we're at now is saying, look, the future is being a logistics provider. We're not just a railroad. We're going to grow through logistics providing, um, deep technology integrations. Uh, how can we enable? You look at the supply chain issues across the country. What can we be doing now to position our tech and our data and our platforms to make sure that we can help prevent and, and get out of those types of problems in the future um, and be leading as that logistics provider. So I've had the opportunity over the last several months to uh, help devise that strategy and then take on leading that initiative, taking us into um, the cloud where there's you know lots and lots of compute and lots of opportunities to do great um, things with our data and building out that modern insights platform. So uh, very exciting. Um, CJ, I like a lot how you talked about kind of uh, embracing and, and helping empower your teams and, and leading them towards how they relate back to that mission, um, which I think is so critical. As a railroad, I mean, some people think, what, what are you doing tech at the railroad? But to me, it's always been very exciting and motivating because we are, you know, that that backbone really of how the goods and services we use every day end up on those shelves. So um, it's an exciting journey. And again, I have to plug, there's lots of really great opportunities and job listings out there if you're looking for something um, of all, all types of roles. Uh, the railroad is a great place. Yeah. Thank you, ladies. So we're going to go ahead and just kind of maybe uh, we'll start with some questions and then maybe we'll have some time for Q&A. So if we get a chance to, uh, if you have any questions, you can put, type them in a the chat box or you can unmute afterwards and you can um, ask them, uh, ask each of the participants. So as we know, things are changing. The last two years have been challenging for everyone, making things uh, really difficult. And I you know you talk about the 2050, we're like, I don't even know what's gonna happen tomorrow, you know, but just having that visionary mindset of, of gosh, what, where are we going? Where do we wanna go, right? So I would just love to kind of learn a little bit more about like what are your organizations are doing to kind of stay future ready? What are some of the things that you guys are focusing on and, and maybe, maybe take us uh, kind of a little bit through your, to your strategic planning or where some of the initiatives that you guys are working with. Anyone like to go first? Uh, sure. <laughs> I can jump in there. Oh, CJ. In, CJ. <laughs> give you guys just a little bit more context. And so I think here at OPPD, um, we're really trying to figure out from an energy perspective, you know, what's happening with our energy in the world. There are a lot of things going on and we've got to come up with uh, energy sources that are not going to be as damaging to our planet, right? And so one of the things that uh, we're doing, uh, not even one of the things, but many of the things that we're doing when it comes to 2050, I'll just give you a couple of the things that we're talking about here. So part of our strategic planning um, is perfect power. And when we're talking about perfect power, we're really talking about reliable, resilient, and secure energy, right? Um, and part of that is enabling interactive services and intelligent solutions. And that's, that's really key to, to what we do. That is the core of what we do. There are a lot of, I'm gonna call ancillary areas um, that are connected to that. But the reason why OpenBD exists is to provide power to our community. And we have to be able to do that in a way where it's affordable, <laughs> right? Um, and that we're giving people what they expect and that we actually understand when someone's having issues with their power. And so as we're looking at, you know, how do we make that happen? And part of that is becoming more of a digital utility, right? And kind of the old adage of what energy, you know, utilities uh, were in the past, you know, when we were originally built, think about 75 years ago, that landscape is not the same. And so we have to morph and evolve as a, as a utility in order to meet the needs of today and tomorrow. The other part of that is customer freedom, right? And so we're talking about um, unobstructive access to solutions and dynamic, um, that are as dynamic, excuse me, and as personal as, uh, as customers that we serve. And so we want our solutions 
to be customer friendly. We want our end users to have things that are, you know, not just slick, but things that actually work for them, right? Um, so again, you know, some of our applications are a little antiquated and outdated. And so we're really going through our technology stack. I see some OPPD people on here. Um, glad that you guys are joining us um, to understand how do we modernize our applications and our tools, right? Um, and then there's cleaner world. And we all know that we need to have a cleaner world. We have to take care of our planet because we only get this one. We don't get another one. Um, the other part of that is being digitally driven. And that is making sure that, you know, it's secure, resilient, and a digitized experience for our customer owners, employees, and partners. Um, so even though I work here at OPPD as an employee, I'm also a customer. And so that gives me a unique perspective and insight as to what's going on every day. And also being able to give feedback on to how do we make um, our utility um, be more digital than what it is today, going back to some of that, how do we um, provide the perfect power? We also wanna be a purpose-driven culture. And what does that mean? That means we want engagement, we want empowerment, and we want people to really buy into our mission because it really is a fantastic mission that we hear, that we have here at OPPD. And so that really is making sure that our people understand that they are empowered to make decisions at their level that impact our organization. And so having the leadership here really work with their direct reports to give them that empowerment that they need, especially as we're making transformational moves into the future. And then we wanna be future ready, right? We wanna have that future ready posture. And I think that's really important for us to keep our eye on the industry. And it's really important for us to understand what's happening in the landscape of, um, of energy and to figure out how do we fit into that. Either we're gonna be tagging behind and we're gonna be lagging behind and trying to catch up or we wanna be forefront runners in that, right? We wanna be innovative, we wanna be creative. We want people to see us at OPPD and say, oh, look what OPP, OPPD is doing in the utility industry. Like that is something that we wanna model ourselves after. And so I think that's really the, the turn of the tide for us is trying to get to that space. And again, it's really exciting, but um, there's a lot of work to do and it's gonna be a lot of hard work to do as many of the OPPD, OPPD people, oh my God, I can't speak, OPPD people on the call can attest to, it's busy, just like it's busy everywhere. Um, and as we're morphing, we're also growing and we have lots of positions open that have to be filled in the technology space. And so I think we're all facing some of the same challenges when it comes to the growth that everyone is experiencing within technology and understanding how do we fill those positions with qualified people that can also bring their different diverse backgrounds and experiences to the table so that we can come up with the very best solutions that really morph our company and what it's gonna look like tomorrow because um, we have to be able to change and we have to be flexible, but we have to be able to do it at a pace that's a lot quicker than what we're, we're usually used to. And so um, I'm, I'm super excited about it. If you haven't had an opportunity to go out to OPPD's website and take a look at the strategic initiatives that are out there because uh, it's a lot of public knowledge that's out there, I highly encourage you to just take a look at some of the exciting things that we're doing. Thank you, CJ. That was great, CJ. I'll just tag on to that. I think you hit a key point, and that is you have to continue the same here. You have to continue to have a pulse on your clients and the direction and be agile to change when you're not headed in the right direction. So mm -hmm. what are those what are those key points that you are checking in on to say, is the decisions we made, whether they be six months, a year ago, 18 months ago, are they still the right decisions to go yeah. forward? Um, you know, in general, I don't think anyone, you know, could have could have uh, seen what was coming in 2020 and what it did to business and the disruption and um, some businesses, literally their business halt. I felt like we all halted. Then others catapulted forward and they had best best years than they've ever had. Others were slower to start and then they bounced back. And um, the same happened with employment too. So now we were seeing, right, then it overcorrected. We were seeing this great resignation. Now we're starting to see the, uh, the ending of it. And, you know, companies are announcing either stopping hiring. Some of those big tech firms in Silicon Valley recently said, we're not hiring anymore. It's all on hold. And then there's a few others that said they're already anticipating layoffs and or laying off ahead of what could be a recession coming. Yeah, if you study another economist, they'd say, no, we're fine. We're going to make it through. There won't be a recession. So I guess um, the, 
the moral is you have to literally have backup plans for backup plans to pivot to know what points are you watching? And from a technology architecture, you know, this can relate to every aspect of your business. From a technology architecture standpoint, we all have project plans and um, projects that, you know, we can press on the gas and make go further, both in time, resources, and money. And then some you can slow down. Mm -hmm. But there are some that it would cost more time, resources, and money to slow them down just because of the, whether it be, um, you know, the knowledge shift or relearning or, you know, or contractors you're hiring, whatever that is, some of them you can't just stop because it could literally cost millions to do that. Yet there's others you need to know when you can slow down to speed up. So um, it is important to, I just, in fact, today, I just sent a, a note to my team. We're gonna do an unplanned uh, security simulation exercise where um, I hope it never happens, but man, let's plan for a day that we hope never happens rather than not plan and not be ready. So it's kind of that situation and everything that comes up, you know, what are your most important priorities? Which ones could you slow down? And if you did, what implications could they have? If you do need to speed them up, how do you do that? Um, but, you know, I really hope, you know, everything's, you know, just like all of you heard, we're all hiring right now. Business is great. But um, I think if anything we've learned in 2020 is make sure you have a backup plan for a backup plan. And then of course, I love um, Herb Kelder, the um, founder of Southwest Airlines has that famous quote of, um, you know, plan in good times as if they were bad or manage expenses in good times as if they were bad. Meaning um, sometimes when things are going really good, you don't just want to let, you know, you don't just want to step on the gas and uh, you still need to be a little bit conservative because we need to make sure we're always tightly managing the importance of all of our people's time and what they're working on and then know when um, when you can pull those levers. So yeah, anyone's guess as to what's gonna happen in the next two to four years. But I think as long as there's you know planning and discussions and, um, and, and there's conversation happening about it and transparency, you know, we'll get through it all. Yeah. That's a good point. Do you wanna, mm -hmm. Stephanie, do you wanna go next? Yeah, absolutely. So some great points there that I'll kind of piggyback on and, and shift a little bit. Um, with where I take it. So um, having the foresight to think, see things where, where things are going. And then CJ, I like how you hit on that, that culture. You said purpose-driven culture. If I look at Union Pacific, kind of get the future ready right now, we're really focused on people and on technology. And, and those are kind of the key things that we need to shift to be ready for that future. As, you're, as you mentioned, Katie, it's, it's unknown, right? There's some, we need to be able to pivot faster than we could ever pivot before. We need to be able to react more quickly. Um, and for us, that focus is really on people um, and focusing in on those shared outcomes. And so over the last, I mentioned already, the strategy that we focused in on is um, how do we need to pivot our technology and our workforce and our people to be ready to support that growth at the rapid pace that we need to support it. Um, and for us, one of the key things, there's, there's really two, there's focusing on customer centricity, focusing on you know prioritizing all of our mindset and what we're doing back to that customer um, and what it is that they're requiring of us. And then two, that, that people, that mindset. Um, and, and culture, when you talk about culture, it really comes down to knowing what you're driving after and how you get everyone bought into that same um, vision. And so for us, uh, we had a big leadership conference. We have one every year at the beginning of the year. The top several hundred leaders of the company um, from across the company come together. Um, and this year, we spent a lot of time focusing on what are our top 12 outcomes that we as a company are driving. So if you take everything that every everyone works towards, we boiled it down to these are our 12 must have outcomes. Um, and so cascading from that and looking as we planned our year, we're being really diligent about making sure that everyone on all of our teams at all levels understands how their day-to-day -day activities are driving back towards those shared outcomes. Because that's ultimately what gonna, what's going to help us transform and pivot and keep that pace. Um, the other thing we touched on, um, the people side, there's, we talked a little bit at the beginning informally, um, the job market, you know, hiring and how we're, you know, keep up that Omaha. Um, that's a big deal for us. So making sure that we figure out ways to empower, engage and maximize um, what we do have and, and what we're focused on is key for us to being uh, future ready. Um, the other piece of that is um, really knowing people as humans. One of the big initiatives that UP has undertaken um, over the last um, couple years is really that focus on diversity and inclusion. That's one thing I'm actually pretty proud of seeing um, that come to light. I think we're, we're looking forward to the future is how we need to be focused on um, developing and being inclusive uh, and really looking at, at that in a meaningful way 
um, to embrace people and make sure that we've, we've rolled that out in a way that we can maximize the skills um, and the ideas and the perspectives that we have across our force um, to make sure that we're truly not only staying customer centric, but maximizing um, the teams that we're building, the empowerment, and then the, um, the outcomes that we're getting from those teams. Uh, the other piece of that is on the technology. I mentioned we're modernizing our technology. I think we've all mentioned that. I don't think there's been an individual in the industry that I've spoken with. Um, I just came back from a conference who isn't modernizing in some way, right? There's tech debt, there's modernization, um, but we all recognize that it's key. We need to be in a position where we're leveraging the, the platforms and the technology stacks that are available to us and that we're putting a heightened focus and discipline around some of these architectural decisions. So for us, taking a step back and looking about how we got here, siloed data sets, siloed systems, it was natural. We grew up 160 year old company, you have different divisions, different reasons for that. Um, going forward, our strategy is really optimizing around our data and optimizing around our platforms because that is what's going to enable us to drive the growth that we need um, to be more effective as a logistics provider. Uh, so those are really, when I think about what we're doing to be future ready, again, it's, it's, it's focusing on um, what it is that we need to be going after and be very, very targeted and diligent about staying the course to those and then understanding how we build and empower those teams around those. Okay. Any questions from the audience so far about what you've heard? Okay, we'll keep things moving. So as you're thinking about, you know, the future, like what are some of the skills you'd say, um, you know, you, you think pe people will need in the, in the future as they're moving towards, you know, future ready? Like what are some of the skill sets, um, some of the strengths that they should be working on, maybe upskilling, you know, their workforce? What are some of those things that you'd maybe from each one of you, like what, what, what's, what would that be for you, you think? You want to go ahead, Stephanie, just... you want me to take it first? <laughs> I, I can go ahead if you want. I can yeah, keep on go going. For it. All right. Uh, so this is this is one of the fun parts for me. I really I think I think about this a lot. I love reading. Um, I just love being inspired by these types of topics. And I recently came back from um, a Snowflake Summit conference and had the opportunity to listen to Frank Slintman, who wrote the book Amp It Up. Um, he had some really interesting um, perspectives on this, and it really resonated a lot with our current journey and how we're we're thinking about this. So when I think about the traits of a future ready leadership, energy, drive, focus. Those are the key things that come to mind, again, because when we look at the future and the uncertainty and the speed at which we need to operate compared to perhaps where some of our larger um, legacy organizations have operated in the past, we're shifting. Um, we need to transform. And so as part of that, really understand your culture. Know what your culture is. Know what the culture you need of your team. And then be diligent. Every interaction we have, um, we need to embody that culture. And, and every um, time we look at building teams, placing people with teams, making sure that culture fit, I think is going to be key for that future success um, and, and getting us ready to move at that pace and move at that drive. Um, one of the things that he actually called out in his book, he called it a key leader needs to have intellectual honesty. I like to think of this as basically self-awareness. Um, and he challenged, can you see your world how it really is? Um, and he challenged that we like to look things through, we like pleasing responses. Future ready leaders need to be okay and comfortable having those difficult conversations, seeing things through a new lens and being willing to make those changes when the changes feel very scary and uncomfortable. And so to me, it's about swift action, risk taking, um, but the undertone of that is always focusing on people first, right? We're all, we're all people, we're all motivated. Um, through knowing each other and having meaningful interactions. And so one of the most powerful things we as, as, as future ready leaders can do is making sure that we're truly getting to know our people, understanding what motivates them, understanding their strengths, and making sure that we're being um, fair to our teams, our culture, and those individuals by making sure that we're doing our best to pair those up in ways that we're going to maximize them. That was excellent. Yeah. I would just add, um, and maybe it's just adding on to what you said, transparency. Um, I think it's really good to be transparent with people, even when things are uncertain, just saying it's uncertain right now, but here's what we do know. And here's the process we're going to go through when we make decisions. I think it's important for people to understand context. So when a decision is made or direction change, or we're implementing a new technology or 
Uh, maybe we shift direction. You know, what's the context behind it? And what was the thought process about why we changed the direction and um, where we're going in the future? And then making sure that we're painting that picture of what that exciting future is so that people can see a part of it and how they are a part of it and how they fit in. Um, so I think that all, you know, uh, summarizes in just communication that um, whether it be, you know, how, and you do need to communicate with people in several different touch points. Some, you know, I've learned, I've learned email, we're all inundated with email. It's too easy just to skim. So then do you have one-on-ones? Do you have group meetings? Do you have time when you can have Q&A sessions and people can feel like they can really um, understand whether it be the strategic direction or change or the future and where we're going. And then again, how are they a part of that? And how are, um, and what is the work that they're doing every single day impact that? Um, and then I think one other thing you said was about, um, I think it's important as leaders too, is going on strengths, is to know where you are an expert and where you are not. And we are not all good at everything. Um, you know, growing up, you know, let's say 30 years ago, I think the world tried to condition us that we should be well-rounded and we should be good at everything. And the reality is we're not, we're all unique. We're, and thank God we are. And, but we should find people that have that complement us so that if I'm really good at something and there's another piece, um, let's say QA, for example, I'll just use that. I would be the world's worst QA person. Um, I do not have that natural uh, intellectual curiosity to keep going when you think everything's fine. Those Q, those great QA people are like, no, it's not fine. I have to keep going. I'm going to find something. Um, I'm That's not me. So I shouldn't be in that role, but man, I should put people in that role that really thrive at that. And that's their talent. Um, so it's okay to not be good at everything, but it's, but you do need to recognize it when you're not and find those people that are, but then you do what you're really good at. And you need to know the difference and then surround people that compliment you and delegate things to them where they're better off making that decision and asking opinions. CJ, what would you add to that? That's really good. I really like that. Um, one of the things that we did here uh, last year, I think it was late last year, we did the HBDI, which is just, just another assessment, you guys. Think of Emergenetics, DISC, and all that. But what that really did show for our team dynamics is what, are, what our preferred way of thinking is. And so that, to what Katie was saying, you know who's good at what and what they prefer, right? And so you want to make sure that you put those people in the right roles also. It helps you with engagement. One of the things that I will say leading into the future with my, my team in particular that I think is important is for me to help them have an agile mindset. I think that's really important. Um, a lot of times people have been in their roles for a very long time and we kind of get used to, used to doing things a certain way and we get quote unquote married to things. And one of the things that I'm really getting my team to focus on is don't get married to it because it can change tomorrow. Um, I really want them to, to be ready for change to be able to embrace it more or embrace it more easily than, than normal. And Cy Wakeman, ha Cy Wakeman has a, a quote that I actually love and it is change is only hard for the unready. It, it's so true. When you're not ready and you're not anticipating change, you spend so much energy hemming and hawing over it and asking like, who made this decision and why this and why that? Um, and what I really want my team to focus on is the how and the what. The decision has been made. So let's just figure out how, to, how do we do our part in order to make that decision come to fruition. So that's one of the other things. I really like the fact that you guys touched on transparency. I think that is so key as a leader to be transparent about what's going on at the level above you and at your level so that your team understands how that impacts them and that you are advocating for them every day and that you're bringing communication back down to them so they have the clarity and connection that they need. The other thing that my team is really focusing on right now is enablement. Being in QA and in release, um, we are not like sponsors of projects. We don't do that kind of thing, but we are supporters of the work. And so I have to support a whole variety of different domains within technology and security. And one of the things that we are looking to do and the changes that we're making right now is how do we enable our partners to do some things, right? Kind of teach them how to fish so we don't become the bottleneck. So we don't slow down the process. And to me, that's called mm -hmm. being a good partner, being a good team member, because there's things that I'm responsible for. There's things that I have to be the gatekeeper for. But how do I set you up in a way that you can get further along without me having to stop and pause you all the time? That doesn't feel good to you. It doesn't feel good to the business. It doesn't feel good to anybody. 
So how do we get people to, to, to kind of fall into that enablement mode or give you what you need? And then the other thing is just execute with excellence and consistency. I think that is just really, really important as we move forward is to be able to do things in an excellent manner and just being a little more intentional. That's the word I'm going to use about the work that we do and just making sure that it's aligning to the, to the greater picture. So, yeah. Great. Yeah. All great. There's also a question in chat. Um, what are, what are your work from home policies? How is it, how is that working when competing for talent all across the U.S.? And most are working from home, as if most are working from home. What are you doing to foster the culture you want in the organization? So we, I answered mine. We have a hybrid. Um, we have a hybrid policy, but it's not required. So we encourage people a couple of days a week in the office. We don't keep track of it. Um, there's times when we'll have, like we're having a, a College World Series fun tailgate barbecue on Thursday for lunch. And so we told people we're having it and they'll come. Um, but we don't, you know, if someone has a sick kid that day or they have an appointment that can be moved, you know, that's fine. Uh, it's life. So we talk about work-life integration and we did, we did this pre-COVID that um, we always supported work-life integration, that there's times you need to be home and times you need to be at work and um, and what's most important is that you know what your tasks and objectives are and what you're responsible for and that that's happening and you're surrounded by teams that you can build those great relationships. And um, so that's our policy. And I would say we do have on any given day, half of our workforce is here and it's not required. What about, what about you, CJ or Stephanie? Sure, I can, I can go. So. OPPD for a large part of the organization um, is work from home. But again, we have so many different positions that are out in the field or anything like that. So of course those positions are different, uh, but there is a large part of the company that is work from home. Um, and we are work from home for the foreseeable future for the next few years. Um, so that's how that, that is working out. I'm eager to see that when we do come back to the office, what that actually gonna look like, is it gonna be hybrid, like what? So. We are in the middle of creating collaboration spaces so that our teams can get together, you know, however many times they feel like they need to do um, in order to get the work done and have some face to face time with one another. Um, as far as remote work um, outside of the local area, we do have remote workers that do live outside of the state of Nebraska. We do have some of those in some cases. And one of the things that we're trying to do. Um, because the people who work from home locally, we get together. Like my team, we just got had a whole shindig in Lincoln at someone's house on Friday, and it was great. We cooked food, it, we, we play music, they played the guitar, we sang, we, had, we danced, we had fun. Um, but for a, a couple people on my team, they're not here. So how do I continue to have that engagement with them? And it's by having kind of like the online virtual parties um, and social time without talking about work. So I'll have the rule, like we're not talking about work at all. This is strictly get to know each other time. What's going on with you? What's going on with your family? Like, what are you interested in? What's your, what's your passion? And what, do you have a purpose that lays outside of your job? Like, what is that? Let us, you know, find out what that is. And it's really about building relationships. And when you have genuine relationships, then you build trust. And when you have trust at your team, it goes a long way with that team dynamics. And so I think that's really important. And that's really kind of what I'm doing on my team. I remember when, when things were, the things was back in March, right before the pandemic happened. And then, you know, within like two months later, they're like, OPD, OPPD mentioned they're not going back till January. We're like, oh, we'll be back in like a, a month or two. We'll be back. You know, this is just like a stay at home for like two months. And then like, I was like, so that, I thought that was kind of crazy, but here we are. Like you guys, I feel like you guys had first seen like way before anyone else and saying that you wouldn't go back till January. And then two years later, we still have this issue. And so it was just interesting to see how, how things have shifted and how things have been moving. So yeah. What about you, Stephanie? Yeah, Union Pacific has um, adopted a hybrid policy across the company and tech has followed suit. So our policy is 50% in office. Uh, and we do um, ask that our, our employees live in the metro area where we have an office. And we've also been experimenting. We have, we have a satellite office in Colorado for our subsidiary, PS Technology, that builds software solutions um, that we commercialize. And so that's worked well. Um, we found you know, similar to Katie, how you mentioned, if, if you if you make it a reason for people to want to go, they're, they're going to want to go. And I think that we've seen for the most part, teams have struck a really great balance between 
um, that balance of having that time at home and skipping that commute a few days a week, um, and then also making sure we have that meaningful in-person time to really, for those collaborative sessions, those team building events, um, and just that face time. Uh, it's worked really well. There's obviously going to be individuals that just would rather be on their computer in their house and never leave. But uh, so far for us, I think we see the benefit. Um, and about all of you, but I remember coming back at first after um, we were finally starting to come back in office and feeling this like sense of energy that I didn't even know I was missing about just like having that in-person conversation. So I think for us, that's been working well. Um, there's obviously challenges with recruiting. I think everyone's, you know, lost folks to um, companies that aren't local to Omaha when they're offering 100% remote. Um, and we'll continue to watch it as it plays out over the next, you know, year plus. But uh, it's been it's been a good fit for us. And I think the key is really um, making sure that people understand the spirit of the policy and not focusing on the letter of the policy, because you'll have, you know, analytical folks that want to understand, does that mean I have to be there two and a half days a week? Or does that mean I have to be there, you know, certain hours? And so making sure people really embrace what the spirit is, need to be showing up around half the time and making meaningful connections with those that you need to interact with, um, and then leveraging the flexibility when it makes sense. So that's been our approach. Yeah, I know a lot of you, some different organizations like having to go back in person has, has been a little challenging because, you know, they're like, you have a lot of different cultures that are, you know, the shifting cultures that like we should we go back and we do how things were, were before. And it's like, well, and then we have the, this, you know, the other generation that's like, well, I'm not going back ever again and I'm going to go over there. And so it's just it's a really challenging time for right. everyone. So I think, you know, just giving up. I, I think the 50 50 option is a good option, you know, for most or most organizations, but you do still have that in person and then still have people have opportunity to be able to, you know, work from home living in Blair. I'm like a 30 minute commute. I'm like, that just I, it sounds so far now, you know, every time I have to go for in the office, you know, but I used to do it every day and it was fine, you know, and all of a sudden you just kind of got used to certain things. Um, gas prices probably I know. Right? Oh a lot of people wanting to drive downtown, you know, if you live oh, out west or in a smaller town. Too. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Um, anything else from the audience? Any questions you, you might have? So Robin had a good question in the chat. What's the reason for forcing people to come back in and the benefits? So Gallup did yeah. a study on this. And so our study we originally did was pre-COVID on engagement of people who were fully remote or that were in um, an office part or full time. And what the study found is that people who were connected to an office were a little bit, were more engaged with their work and their teams than they were working fully remote. Now, but if you dig in deeper to say, okay, why? It was really because of a few things. One is they felt connected. So they felt this bigger connection when they were seeing people, they were having hallway conversations, conversations were occurring. You know, you think about if you're all together for a meeting, the meeting ends, typically there's, you know, some small hallway chatter, people are eating lunch together, they're building friendships. And so then they're building these great relationships. Now, that being said, it also depended on your tenure in an organization because um, we have individuals who were in that atmosphere, then they went home. Well, they already had that great foundation of relationships and understanding the business and the culture. So it could continue to be fostered. So then what we've learned in going through COVID and now having, you know, in-person versus remote, at the end of the day, from a productivity standpoint, I would contend it doesn't really matter. If you have a way to, me to measure what your objectives are, that they're getting completed, whether it happens in two hours or four hours, it doesn't really matter. It's more about are people doing what's expected of them and we're meeting the objectives of the business, right? But there is also a component of that for retention and engagement and overall well being that depending on who you are, not everyone's going back to not everyone's the same. We do have people that a lot of, you know, they may have relocated to Omaha. And so for them, their connection is their workplace and that's how they're meeting people. And they're also using that as part of their social interaction. So for them, they do want those opportunities because people get so much more from work and careers than just work, right? They make friendships, they feel a sense of mission and belonging and purpose of what they're doing. And so it's back to, I think Stephanie made this point of, if we're giving people a reason to come, they want to come. So um, I think at the heart of it is, if you're having opportunities in your workplace that um, they can build connections. They can have time where they're sitting and learning about the overall bigger mission and purpose, and they're together and collaborating. Those are all really good reasons to be to bring people together. If you're telling someone, get in your car for $5 a gallon just because I want to see your face at work, and then they're going to sit in their office and do Zoom or their, or their meetings and they're not interacting with anyone anyway, that makes zero sense. So 
I do think it matters by team and there's not one exact right answer or one exact wrong answer. It is all depending upon your culture and the tenure, what activities you're doing outside of work from home. Are you having those opportunities for people to make connections, to learn from each other, to mentor, to whiteboard? Um, Cause there's so, again, there's just so much more that people get from work than the actual work that's getting done. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think we're, we're doing permanent work from home or hybrid or whatever people want to do. But like I said, like 99% of my people are staying hundred percent remote. And so we've had to make, you know, a really conscious effort of we're going to set aside these times during the week to have just social time. It's virtual, but it's Perfect. social. Yeah. Um, and then we're doing a lot more in-person things like monthly, you know, once a month getting together and that kind of stuff. But they really, really, really don't want to come back. And, and like I said in my chat, I'm finding that I've had a flood of applicants now that people are starting to require, you know, hybrid or permanent work in the office. Um, they're like, I've proven that I can do my job remote, you know, and I'm happy. Yeah. And um, so, you know, they're, they're like the corporate culture is saying, I need to feel this way, but I don't feel this way. You know, yeah. So the vast majority. It's tough. Our latest study is the vast majority do not want to go to work. They do not want to go to work. Specifically, yeah. don't tell me to go there five days a week. Yeah. And when you think about, gosh, I I just had a conversation with some other moms on my team, and my kids are older now. They're fourteen and eighteen, but I had no clue how I did it when they were young. No, oh. none. Like, no clue. Um, somehow I did, and you know, everyone managed to. You know, they're pretty good, small humans, but uh, it's it's just, we get pulled, especially as moms. Moms still do the majority of work. Or, I mean, our study shows moms still do the majority of the work mm -hmm. in terms of like household work and chores and cooking and stuff. Not everyone, it's not everyone, um, but we do like, I, I don't know why. I, you know, some days I'm like, if my husband makes some mac and cheese and hot dogs, will they die that day? No, but <laughs> um but, uh, but yeah, it's moms need it. They want to be able to, um, feel like they can be there when they can and get their work done when it works for them. And, um, I work from home two days a week and I'll be honest. I love the, I, I love it. I also love being in the office and those connections of people and I get energy from being around other people and some of the in-person mm -hmm. meetings I get to do, but I don't want to go back to five days either, but the world's saying that too. The other thing, the world, the other thing is, um, people also just don't want to be told what to do, right? They may want to go in the office two days, but they don't want someone to track them and mark it off on a sheet or something. Um, so yeah, the majority don't, but yeah. I think there are some good re healthy reasons why it's good to have a workplace to go to, but it's good to offer flexibility when you can. And we also have to keep in mind, there are jobs that that is just not possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think another part I, of it, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, you're good. Okay, I was going to say, I think another part of it also that we don't think about is, you know, what does that work environment in the office actually feel like? And the only reason why I say this is I know that um, <laughs> OPPD, as much as I love this company, I mean, the building is not exactly, in my mind, maybe conducive for the best work, meaning it's dark, it's dingy, it's old, it's yeah. just, it's stale. If you go in the building now, and I don't know if it's because it's empty, but I think it was like it before, it's just like, kind of like, this is depressing. I, I'm at home and I know everyone doesn't have the same home setup, but I have an office. It's bright. It's airy. I can step out on my deck. I it's can go beautiful. Outside. You know, I thank you. <laughs> thank you. And yeah. what really brought this home for me, Monica, is when I went to the graduation and we were over at Farm Services and I walked in the building and it was like bright and airy and open and there's all these wonderful colors. And I was like, heck, if I had to come in here every day, yeah, I'll drive down the street and come here every day. Right. But if I have to go somewhere where it's dark and dingy, like, yeah. Yeah. Of yeah surprisingly, there, there are people there. A lot of the people are actually back in person, like uh, almost, yeah. almost like 100%, which is, you know, but again, like if you give them the space and the reason to, to come and connect, like they'll be more likely to, to go versus like you have to be there three times a week. There's like no one here. So, you know, so just giving those reasons and yeah. why, the why behind it, right? I think that's what's so important. Yeah. And it's last point that came to my mind was we had talked a little bit about change too, right? And so a lot of folks have just gotten really comfortable with that's their new reality. And so the idea of change is hard. And it might not be that they would actually hate the idea of being in the office a couple of times a week, if, but it's that idea of change, I think that's difficult. 
you know, there was a time when I worked for a team and we kind of got moved out of the main bright area headquarters into an office across the street. Um, and we all went kicking and screaming, saying, this is going to be terrible. It's going to be horrible. We won't be able to fly, you know, nah, 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 the whole laundry list. We got there. There's a new open concept. We loved it. Almost four years later, they wanted to move us back in the building. And we're like, oh, my gosh, this is going to be terrible. We're not going to be able to, you know, nah, 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 the whole laundry list of complaints. And we got back and we're like, oh. We got used to it and into our new groove and it was great. So I think part of it too is just for people, the idea of I'm here, I like it, this is what I'm comfortable. I can't imagine changing um, when maybe maybe there is something to that that 50% for some roles. So yeah, I ended up having my so when we first started working from home, my husband ended up doing this. Um, I don't know if we'll actually go live, um, but it's a it's a virtual background that you kind of, you can switch different, <laughs> different lights and actually plays with the music. So if you ever want to turn on like, let's see, love. Five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> <That's cool. laughs> so, I was partying at her desk. <laughs> I was like, no, no boring meetups, right? No boring virtual meetups. Uh, so yeah, so that's, um, any last que any last questions from the audience? Are we, at six fifteen, we're going to go go ahead and do a raffle. But just any last questions from the audience? Any last? Okay, then maybe we'll just go around and do any last thoughts from the panelists. Like any maybe, but maybe what, you, what you're doing, or you know how how you're looking to the future. What are you doing? Or, you know to stay future ready, whether it's a mindfulness or your health or your any sessions that you're, any leadership training that you're taking for yourself, like how are you preparing yourself for the future? Is that for anyone? Are you putting it in the chat? Um, that maybe from the panel, yeah, and then maybe from from okay. the audience as well, yeah. Like if you, if anyone okay. wants to share from the audience, what are you doing, you know, to kind of help you as you know as you're moving forward to the, in the, into the future? What are you doing? Um, I know I have a, a morning routine that I'm like, uh, that's like my thing to do. If I don't do that in the morning, like wake up to chaos with you know poopy diapers and what, but I'm like I, I need my hour of of power to just to kind of you know to have a good day, and so uh, I've been really you know, consistent with my getting up an hour early before everyone else, just to kind of have my mindset and my, you know, just prepare for the day. And so uh, definitely has made a big difference for, for, for my, when it comes to my, my health and, my, you know, mental well-being. So what about anyone else? Yeah. We have the pillars that I call the pillars of well-being, right? So I do an hour for myself every day. I'm with you, Rob, and I'm up at 4.30 at the gym. Um, so 4.30 uh, a.m. workout, I think it's important to spend time reading every single day. Um, even if it's just a short article, it's great to, um, I subscribe to The Economist, um, Harvard Business Review, CHR or CIO Dive, a couple other tech ones, and they just you know push me articles. So it's just pick one or two to read every day. And then I try to set aside at least an hour every day to read, but it's hard, you know, you, you also have to sift through it because the news can be awfully depressing. So, you know monitor that. And then um, I think it's important too, especially if you're moms, that you take time every day to have an important moment with your kids. So sometimes it's more than others. And especially teenagers, sometimes, you know, you'll get what you can take. Um, for me lately, it's been um, after Legion baseball games that are over at 1030 or 11 at night. And that's when my kid wants to be chatting with me. And I'm like, I get up at 430. But, you know, you take what you get. So make sure you take time every day to be with your kids or with your spouse or partner or, um, or you know, friends. Your well-being, read a lot. 4.30, I'm not part of the 4.30 a.m. club yet. I'm like 6 a.m. So. We're a whole different breed. People think we're crazy that don't actually get up then. They're like, you people are nuts. That's amazing. What time do you go to bed? You said 11? That's 11, that's late though. Well, like I don't know. Last night I was excited that they all went to the College World Series and I went to bed at nine. Yeah. but oh gosh, I wish sometimes I it's 11 it just depends yeah I'm gonna I'm gonna try to get there Katie one day if I can make it to bed before 1 a.m um that'd be great um <laughs> but that's part, partly my fault because I'm so busy um I do power hour in the morning and so it's at least 20 minutes of exercise and movement I don't care what it is you know just go zone in for 20 minutes 20 minutes of um you know meditation or prayer whichever, and then 20 minutes of journaling. And, and that has been very helpful to 
get me to be very intentional about my day and the things that I want to accomplish that day, things I want to accomplish that week. I have goals. I have so many things that I want to get done for this year that some of them are work related. A lot of them are not. They're just personal things that, you know, from my own development that I want to achieve. And so if I don't have my power hour, I'm getting off track and I don't feel like I'm ready for my day before my day gets started. So for me, that's, that's what I do. Like it. Uh, you know, I, the morning routine is awesome. I wish I could say mine was as amazing as you ladies, uh, you know, again, the things to aspire to, uh, but for me, some of the things that I focus on, the reading is important. So reading both for, for personal interest and for professional development is very important to me. Um, another thing that I make a habit of is at least, um, a couple of times a week, making time for a connection, a meaningful connection with someone, you know, outside of my family and my work group where I can connect with whether it's someone else in the company or the community, um, and really making sure that I'm, you know, building those those relationships and being able to learn new perspectives, because I find that important when you talk about um, future ready leadership. You and I have to connect more <laughs> outside of work. Yeah, so I, that's one thing. That, so one thing that got brought up is like having those connections with people that not even on your when it comes to your teams, you know, a lot of times you have your own teams, but people outside of your team just to kind of get to know about the different things that are happening within your organization and having that just, you know, quick quick 20 minute conversation and check in with them. Um, so thank you, ladies at 6, 6, 17. We're going to go ahead and do a quick raffle and give away the three tickets. Let's go ahead and unmute and, and thank our amazing panel of leaders. And if you, we are going to um, go ahead and unmute if you're still on, we still have over 20 people on. So go ahead Thanks, and unmute ladies. and let's give it up to our amazing panel. Yay. Thank you for sharing.